Okay, so hello everyone. This is Simona Petrescu and I work for Cambridge Assessment English, supporting teachers with regard to pedagogical and assessment aspects of Cambridge uh, English qualifications. Um, and I'm based in Germany. We're, we're very lucky and happy to be enjoying lots of sunshine today. So um, everything uh, is very motivating for us to, to talk about assessment and learning oriented um, assessment in Cambridge English qualifications. OK, so um, let's move on. So what we're going to look at today, um, we're looking, first of all, at how Cambridge English qualifications support learning for life. This is part of the title of this webinar um, and how in a step by step model. That means that, first of all, we're looking into the connection between assessment and learning and then exploring the learning oriented design of our qualifications. Um, and how can an assessment be designed so as to be learning oriented? Part of this design will need to enable the assessment to provide not just a measurement of abilities, but also make progress transparent. And through this, provide feedback on learning acquired so far, as well as on the next learning goals in line. So we're going to zoom in on the area to see how progress and feedback are embedded in the Cambridge English qualifications by decomposing skills across levels, by selecting consistent task formats, signaling progression from one level to the next, as well as by providing detailed learner oriented results. So um, then let's start by considering the relationship between assessment and learning. But first of all, we'd like to hear what you think. Um, I'm going to open a poll and ask you to choose the answer that is closest to your contact. Now, if you can bear with me while I'm opening the poll uh, so you can see exactly how to answer, where to go. So could I ask you to go to menti.com um, and use a code that you can see on the screen, 922916. And how do you feel about assessment? Does it help you set new learning objectives? Does it help you or your school prove that you have achieved the learning objectives? Or does it get in the way of learning what students really need to learn? Okay, so I can see the first responses are coming in and you can also see them, I hope, on, on the screen coming in live. There is no right or correct, uh, or right or wrong, correct, incorrect answer, of course. Okay, I'm still giving it a few moments. Okay. So menti.com, uh, don't close the uh, the browser window when you're through answering because we'll be getting back to to that site a bit later on. Okay, so um, the opinions are divided. It seems though that the winner is uh, most of you. I think have voted uh, for mm, assessment helping set new learning objectives. This is very nice. But I'm sure that the, the other opinions are mm, just as, as common, just as, as um, frequent. Um, assessment very often used for what we call accountability, to explain, to show, to demonstrate that the teacher or the school or even the government has achieved um, curriculum goals. Um, and quite a few people, teachers, learners, parents may feel that assessment can actually get in the way of the real learning. So thank you very much. As, as I said, 
Um, I'm wait, I'm going to close voting for now. Okay, and let's return, but please don't don't close the browser window because we'll be going back to Menti in a second. Um, where was that? Share application, my PowerPoint. Okay, it's a bit strange. <laughs> okay, so um, it seems that we already have uh, a question to address. Um, and the first fundamental question that arises is um, how does learning or what has learning got to do with assessment to paraphrase a famous song typically we think of assessment as a measurement tool which we use for various purposes such as we've seen um, um, accountability trying to justify what we as teachers have been doing uh, or how well we've been doing it and the same applies for schools and for governments trying to justify their policies um, typically for selection purposes enabling uh, employers, universities, and so on to select the right applicants. And of course, for us in the classroom, most often it helps us, assessment helps us um, keep learners engaged and motivated to cooperate with us and keep learning. But none of these three goals seem to be very closely related to the learning process itself, rather with its outcomes. Um, and um, just to remind you, um, you might be already quite familiar with the terms formative and summative assessment, the first one typically done in the classroom, um, an integral part of teaching, whereas the second one typically done on a large scale at the level of a cohort, um, the cohort being either real, for example, all the students in a particular course program, or generic, um, for instance, any language user taking a proficiency test that places their ability level on a standard scale. Um, and um, continuing a bit with a bit more detail, um, formative assessment being an integral part of teaching, as I said, is an ongoing activity in the classroom and it's often done in order to identify the next teaching and learning need. And therefore it emphasizes interaction, support and development. And, um, takes into account the effect of external social and cognitive factors on the individual cognitive response. For example, in marking your students' homework um, these weeks, you will also bear in mind that the homework was done in less than favorable conditions at home during this corona crisis. So your feedback to the students will take that into account. That is why formative assessment usually lacks reliability and validity, the two supporting pillars of assessment, because formative assessment is less about measurement and more about feedback on learning. Um, on the other hand, summative assessments such as end of term tests, end of year school exams, national exams, and of course Cambridge English qualifications are typically held at a specific moment in time at the end of a study period um, and is linked to a syllabus. That is because summative assessment aims not so much to provide feedback, but to measure achievement or the degree to which a specific set of skills in a syllabus have been acquired. Uh, because of this focus on measurement, summative assessment is often perceived as just grading. Um, something external to what is going on in the classroom. Um, but this distinction, uh, we have to be a bit careful. Uh, if we take all that in, so everything that I said on the previous slide, if we understand that correctly, then it means that formative assessment is a term that typically refers to a purpose. Namely, it's an assessment made for purposes of further learning. That's why we call it formative. Um, by contrast, the term summative assessment does not refer so much to a purpose, but to a kind of judgment on what has been acquired before. This means that these two terms, formative and summative, although they're quite established as such as a pair of terms may be confusing as they do not in fact represent a contrast 
one of them is a type of purpose. The other is a type of judgment. Um, they are nevertheless quite often contrasted um, as if they were part of the of, a, of uh, one and the same dimension. Um, and and many people um, are starting to question um, the ability of a summative test to serve a formative purpose as well. This is a typical question and, and sometimes even it's not even a question considered. It's an assumption that this cannot happen in connection with a, with assessment. So can you tell us what you think using the chat? Do you uh, do you think a summative test can or cannot serve a formative purpose as well? Um, searching for the chat. Why can't I see my chat? <laughs> I've lost my chat box. OK, now I have it. OK, so yeah, it seems that. Yeah, you're you're more or less saying that, yes, it can, it can. I'm glad to hear that there. There is nobody or maybe those who don't agree are not writing. <laughs> um, it could. Someone uh, okay. saying some of the important issues are left behind. Yeah, exactly. Or if pupils are not too much worried by the grade, okay. Um, okay, so there there seems to be a, a relative yes, um, a yes but, a yes under specific conditions, and um, that's why I also try to um, to limit or or to define this answer a bit more on the slide. So yes, um, we also think. Um, uh, a summative can also fulfill a summative test can also fulfill a formative purpose, provided, however, that the summative test, first of all, has a learning oriented design. This is fundamentally a matter of its being designed to reveal achievement, success. Um, even when the test can be used diagnostically in order to identify areas in order in, in need of improvement. Uh, now, success is, of course, revealed in relation to a specific learning path, of course, which is usually provided by a curriculum. In this way, success in a test reflects the achievement of learning goals, meaning that the test doesn't measure other random aspects such as background knowledge or a good musical ear, um, nor does it measure test skills per se. So, um, the tricks and techniques um, for dealing with a with a task format effectively on the exam day. So um, if we make sure that the test does really um, measure abilities in um, in in the skills that are uh, laid down on that learning path in that curriculum, um, then indeed it, it the the test the, the summative test can be used for a formative purpose. Um, and furthermore, the test or the tests in an assessment suite build a map for progress across a level or up the curriculum levels. And results must represent an important feedback tool. Um, and the overall design of the tasks in the test um, needs to make progress across levels transparent. And this is exactly what we're going to look at today. So um, let's see how achievement, this orientation on success on achievement is linked to a learning curriculum um, as embedded in the uh, Cambridge English qualifications design. So as you, um, I imagine, all know since you're attending this webinar, you must be familiar with Cambridge English qualifications, at least uh, to know what they are. Um, the qualifications represent a suite of exams providing in-depth assessment of all four language skills. Uh, but that's not everything to it. Um, the Cambridge English qualifications are anchored um, or are built on uh, the can-do philosophy of the Common European Framework and are mapped on its framework of levels of achievement, uh, which is expressed in terms of can-do statements. 
Um, and this is the key to the qualifications learning oriented design. So an orientation towards achievement based on a language construct that focuses on real life skills. And different candidates are given uh, their own detailed picture of what they can do in English. This way their learning is assessed summatively, but through the specific can-do descriptors, they receive formative feedback as to what they have mastered, as well as what their next learning goals might be. Um, so the Cambridge English qualifications are designed with a focus on success, on what the candidate can rather than what they cannot do. Um, fundamentally through this, um, um, through them being anchored in the common European framework uh, of reference. Uh, but there are other elements as well. Um, through the overall preoccupation with fairness. For example, we're very careful about giving candidates the opportunity to demonstrate their skills to the best of their ability. Uh, for example, in the way we conduct the speaking test or in the way we monitor um, the specific uh, delivery um, um, conditions for, for the exams. Um, or extended certification um, is another achievement focused feature. Uh, candidates may prove abilities at a level slightly different from that of uh, the specific exam they took. And we capture this in our results, helping candidates celebrate their success, even if it was at a lower or even more so if it was at a higher level than uh, that of the exam they took. And finally, um, assessment criteria contribute a great deal to this um, focus on success uh, by employing a holistic assessment from a real life pragmatic perspective um, or by giving credit for attempts, even if they are not successful, but we give credit uh, when the candidate attempts more complex language, for example, um, when we give credit when they uh, correct themselves uh, and when we notice that they possess good survival strategies. Um, now, I'm going to show the next poll on menti.com, so uh, be prepared to open menti.com again. Um, I'd like you to think of these four aspects and you will have them in the poll again and try to select which one of them is to you the most important. Oh, I will share again uh, poll number two. OK, so menti.com and there you have the code 406122. So oh, it hasn't come up on the screen. Oh, share, share your screen. Isn't it shared? OK, hold on. Come on. Um, hmm. I'll try to share again. Can you see the slide now? No, we can just see you. Oh, <laughs> OK. <laughs> Somehow. I think you've just stopped sharing. If you go back to the WebEx page and then. Yeah, uh, exactly. Button, just start again. Yeah. Yeah. That's... That's that. no, don't worry, we'll, we'll get it up on the screen, the code. OK. okay. Yeah. Can you see it now? Got it. Yeah, 4261. Oh, Thanks. That's right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so responses are already coming in. Okay. So which of of those aspects I've just mentioned are most important for you and your students? Marking and grading the way we mark um the overall the underlying can do orientation the preoccupation for fairness and the fact that candidates do get a certificate even if their level was not exactly the level of the exam that goes uh, of course downward as well as upwards okay
Okay, so it seems most of you uh, find the can the overall can do orientation the most important, probably also because it's um it's the broadest. It's got the deepest implications, maybe. Finally, somebody being happy about marking and grading being done with a a concern for or with a focus on achievement on what the candidates can do rather than catching them unprepared. Okay. Right, so it's um it's interesting to see. Okay, so uh you're less concerned with, with marking and grading uh, what you probably appreciate most and the, your students, what uh, you and your students appreciate most is this overall can-do orientation. Okay, um, thank you very much. I will close voting. Okay, All right. thank you so much. And now let's get back to uh, sharing the the slides. Okay. Hmm, where was I? Here. Okay. So um, we've seen that um, the uh, Cambridge English qualifications are designed to measure success, achievement, but in relation to what? Uh, what's the learning path that they're linked to? Well, of course, one obvious answer is a curriculum embodied by the Common European Framework, which lists language skills at each level through its descriptors. Um, and moreover, the curriculum provided by the CFR is one that is oriented to real life situations and needs. And through this is guiding teaching and learning of languages to their pragmatic use. So the pragmatic use of the languages according to the user's needs in the course of their lives. And this is most commonly embodied in a communicative approach to teaching and learning, uh, a term that, again, uh, we've been uh, familiar, for so, familiar with for so long. Um, but first of all, let's remember um, what are some important, significant aspects of communicative language teaching and learning. After all, can you drop a few lines in the in the chat? Um, let's try to to remember uh, because we're going to see if we can find if we can trace such elements in the exams as well. But what might be significant? Yeah, real language. Thank you. Very good. Yes. Authentic context. OK, somebody has been uh, hacking my slides, my presentation and reading the content ahead of the time. Focus on form that is focused on language. Yes. Practice developing skills, communicative situations. <laughs> OK, <laughs> teaching method. Yeah, well, but um, it's nice and a bit worrying when you see that the participants already know what you're going to tell them. <laughs> OK, yeah, functional language, use of language. Great. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, so um, of course, if you uh, if we were to choose one probably defining element is um, not just knowing the grammar and vocabulary, knowing about the language, but being able to use it in a way that it's appropriate. And then some more guiding principles um, presented on this slide, um, because learning for life as a communicative approach under, undertakes to support requires teaching to select authentic, as you said, authentic learning experiences uh, place language in a context and not teach language for its own sake and aim to elicit language for, from learners that is appropriate to the communicative situation rather than 100% accurate. And all of these features are present, are embedded in the design of the Cambridge English qualifications, um, which are designed on fundamentally on a communicative language construct aiming to enable learning for life uh, through authenticity of tasks, meaning authentic interaction skills, um, mental processes, um, tasks that elicit uh, Canada's language knowledge 
in a context and moreover in a relevant context and assessment criteria that look at the candidate's performance holistically integrating errors and looking for task achievement. And I'm going to show you just one short example, speaking. Um, in real life, people speak for various reasons, of course, most of which can generally be, in, be categorized into either transferring information or exchanging information. Um, when a parent tells a child a story or when a professor delivers a lecture, they are transferring information in a one-way monologue. Uh, while when friends are chatting or office workers are discussing something, they're exchanging information through two-way interaction. Um, a monologue, of course, involves speaking only, whereas interaction requires both listening and speaking. Um, and when developing our speaking tests, it's important to include, of course, both monologue and interaction tasks so that we capture a range of real life communicative situations. For example, one task could ask learners to compare to photographs as shown here. And in another task shown here, we have an interaction between the learners, which is followed by an interaction between the examiner and the learner or the candidates. Um, and finally, uh, speaking depends not just on grammar and vocabulary, of course, but also on using the grammar and vocabulary to talk in a way that is intelligible, that makes logical sense, that flows well, and that works as part of a conversation with another person. So we do um, this uh, in our exams through marking speech against a range of criteria such as grammar, vocabulary, organization, uh, capturing aspects such as fluency, um, of course, pronunciation and interactional skills. Um, this ensures that all aspects of speaking which matter in real life communication are given appropriate weight and categories such as grammar and vocabulary although of course they're fundamental to speaking, are not weighted too much. They're not given too much importance. And we also give a global score, which is a holistic assessment. And that again reflects how speaking is perceived in real life. Um, we have looked so far at how the Cambridge English qualifications um, or their learning oriented design is shaped by a focus on achievement related to a language learning curriculum provided by the CFR and through this anchored in the learner's real life needs. Now let's go on and see how this learning oriented design is further strengthened by the design features that are meant to reveal progress and this way provide feedback to learners such as um, uh, you see decomposing skills, task formats and showing results. Um, but let's take another step back and reflect. Now, to show progress, it means we need to be able to compare results uh, in one test at one level with results in a test at the level above or below. Now, for results to be comparable, some things need to be stable, like a foundation, um, and others will differ and this way mark the progression. Um, and if we look at overall exam formats of Cambridge English qualifications across levels, we may notice fundamental similarities. If they were not fundamentally similar, we couldn't put them in a table. We couldn't compare them at all. So, for example, if we look on the vertical, it's clear that all exams are designed on the same structure, namely they're made up of the same papers or covering the same skills, uh, reading, use of English, writing, listening and speaking. Um, it's true that A to Key looks a bit different by combining reading, use of English and writing in one paper, but all three elements are tested in the exam. Um, and then if we, um, uh, if we look on the horizontal, we notice differences as we move from one exam level to the next, and namely timing increases uh, or timings increase. 
Um, and I could have included, of course, in my table other parameters such as numbers of questions or the number, uh, the numbers of words in the input text and so on. But then the table would have been uh, too small for that. So um, the sum of the things that are the same and constitute the basis for comparing our exams are the competence oriented or communicative oriented construct and it's being anchored in the common European framework, as well as a four skill design. Um, and what about the things that change across levels? Such parameters are meant to show the increase in demands and complexity. These are things like timing, like topics from familiar or everyday to um, abstract um, sub skills, um, or the level of complexity built in the rubric or the task requirement. In the next slides, I'm going to illustrate progression as shown in timing and a number of questions and topics and, and skills. Uh, but, but first of all, um, let's see how progression can be tracked from one exam level to the next by looking at how a skill, a macro skill, in this case, I'm going to look at reading, can be decomposed into sub skills or units of complexity, which are then mapped to the CFR can do statements and then integrated at the corresponding exam level. So here we have, as I said, reading. Now, when we read, we process different levels of information. At the lowest level, we recognize the letters and understand words. And if you take a look, there's a progression in terms of challenge, which is why reading tests in our examinations differ in the coverage of these processes. Um, for example, how tasks in A to key require the readers to do the first two cognitive processes and to a limited extent, the next two. Um, the same range of processes is covered in B1 preliminary, but then B1 preliminary tasks provide a fuller coverage. For example, um, several questions require the ability to understand implied meaning and to read and understand across sentences and paragraphs. Um, B2 first covers an even wider range and um, finally, in addition to all that is or everything that is covered at B2 level, reading requires the ability to understand and process meaning across text, texts at level C1 and C2. Um, this is the case in multiple matching uh, tasks um, with several separate but thematically related texts. Um, but what is probably easier to notice, uh, it's more apparent, uh, instead of decomposing the skills and noticing what subskills are tested at what level, um, it's even easier to track the increase in complexity if we look at and compare task formats and, and um, identifying task formats that are consistent across levels, similar, but they will include parameters that highlight the, the rising uh, level of demand in each of the exams. So um, I've chosen three levels to look at, B1 to C1. Um, and this is an overview of what reading looks like. So um, in each paper, as you can see here in Reading and Use of English, uh, you will see that there are core task formats which are included at all three levels. Uh, plus new task formats that are introduced at levels B2 and C1 to reflect increasing complexity of the paper. Each of the core tasks, such as gapped texts, for instance, although they're fundamentally the same, namely a gapped text, will be made increasingly more complex by a number of features we're going to see in a moment. So, um, if we look at the gap text task at these three level, we can see some differences. In blue on the left hand side, it's a B1 preliminary task. In red in the middle, it's a B2 first task. And in green, it's C1 advanced. Now, don't try to read the text. It's impossible. And 
uh, that's not the point. Um, I would just like you to look and try to catch some differences. Look at, for instance, at the rubrics or the task instructions and maybe at the bottom of the task at what is gap, what is missing, what needs to be put back in the text. Um, I'm going to show each task separately on a slide so you can see it better and then come back to this overview. And in the meantime, I'd like you to, to uh, drop some observations in the chat as to what you notice is making one task more demanding than the other. What element is there that is making it more demanding, more challenging? So I'm going to show you each task one by one. So this is B1. And now B2. And now C1. And now all three of them together again. So maybe you noticed things that are different. Short sentences become longer and then become paragraphs. Very good. The number of items, longer chunks, very good. Exactly. More advanced vocabulary in the higher level, okay. We move from short sentences to paragraphs. Excellent, yes. The length of the text, right. The complexity of the sentences to be inserted. Yep, that's right. Excellent, thank you very much. So the differences you have noticed, first of all, what is being gapped? At level B1, there are short sentences and B2, there are longer complex sentences and C1, what is missing are whole paragraphs. Um, somebody also mentioned um, the number of gaps, the number of questions, five in B1, six in, uh, in B2 and in C1, and also the text complexity. Um, thinking, you don't, as I said, you don't need to go into the text to check that, of course, the grammar and vocabulary will be more complex, but just looking at the title uh, and looking at the topic from a relatively familiar topic to pretty unfamiliar to even uh, text with elements of a scientific text, in fact. That's right. Um, now, we, we can have a, a similar quick analysis of open-closed tasks where the gaps stand for only one word. Here, the focus is on grammar, sentence structure, text structure, and some fixed phrases. But if you notice, the differences again are captured you know, on the on a, on a very superficial level now, without attempting to be very, uh, very, uh, I mean, very detailed in this analysis. It's obvious that the number of questions again differs. There are six at B1 and seven and seven at the higher levels. And again, the text complexity is easy to, to, to notice from uh, looking at the topic again, the title and the overall topic, and even a bit, uh, if you look at the length, the text in B1 is visibly shorter uh, and the paragraphs are, are, are visibly shorter than the other two texts. Um, a similar analysis will go for writing. So again, there are there is a core structure that is repeated. Um, all writing tests from level B1 onward. Uh, require candidates to produce two texts. Part one is always compulsory, while part two is a choice from a range of tasks represented by different genres. And if you look at this graph, you may notice the main differences lie in the genres included. So there are new genres added with each level. Uh, and in the text length, that is required. You, know, you notice the number of words increases from one level to the next. Uh, so these two parameters, number of words and genre, uh, together, as you will see in a moment, with a specific format of the rubric, will make the progression transparent. So here you have, again, um, the three 
part one in, in this case, three part one tasks. Uh, in blue, it's B1, in red, it's B2, in green, it's C1. Now, just trying to guide you smoothly through this because uh, I want to direct your attention to, to the rubric. Um, you may notice that the rubric contains the same type of information. For example, situation, reason for writing, number of words, target reader, at least suggested, um, and some input ideas. What is different and marks the growing challenge is the complexity of the input itself in part one. In B1, we have a short personal letter or email together with the content points to include, which are in the form of prompts. Um, in B2, there is less content in the form of a text, so candidates can no longer get language inspiration from the input. Uh, besides, uh, they're supposed to supply an extra idea by themselves, if you notice. The third idea should be their own idea. Um, in C1, they need to process two types of input, namely making a choice of a facility, but also the opinions expressed by various people. Notice again also the rising complexity of the writing context, as well as of the topic itself. Um, However, once again, we wouldn't be able to spot these differences without the underlying similarities of the task formats, which I mentioned before. So it's essential that, that the task formats are fundamentally similar in order for us to, to notice um, those differences. Um, but because I only focused on levels B1 to C1 up to now, I thought let's bring in the lower levels as well. Um, at lower levels, um, writing is more about producing sentences in response to a visual prompt at level A2 in young learners and also in A2 key. The more complex interactional aspect of writing that has to do with the importance of the target reader and uh, writing purpose is not so present here. Um, you notice that, that the focus here um, or the purpose for writing is in fact to, to write uh, full sentences that are connected to one and the same uh, prompt, to one and the same idea, following an idea across three pictures. Um, also, again, remember uh, from level B1 upwards, candidates need to produce two texts at level A2, there is only one writing task that elicits full interrelated sentences that uh, we normally can call a text. Um, but, whoops, I'm sorry, <laughs> my structure has collapsed. There I am, nothing happened. <laughs> but even um, this task format can be compared to, to B1 preliminary, where candidates may also choose to write a story in part two. Um, the contrast between the rubric is also quite visible. At B1, there is, as we saw, a target reader and with it, a purpose for writing. Um, the additional difficulty of this task at level B1 compared to A2 arises also from the number of words, um, 100. It's not visible here in my screenshot, but it's specifically indicated in B1 preliminary. And also the condition to start from a preset uh, starting sentence. So this clearly shows the extra difficulty compared to level A2. Moving on to listening, um, in listening we see the same phenomenon, namely some core formats at level B1, namely multiple choice in two versions uh, based on a longer script and multiple choice based on short extract and the gap fill task. And then there's one extra format, one extra task format being added with each level up. Um, the progression of, of task difficulty there is, is um, pretty 
easy to notice when we look, and I'm, I'm going to show only one tag. Um, for instance, in the multiple choice short extract, um, in, in B1 preliminary, it's the only uh, situation in, from these three levels, uh, B1 preliminary is the only level where, where the options are visual, they are, they are signs or they are uh, illustrations. Um, uh, but then um, in levels B2 and C1, multiple choice, even on short extracts, are based on text, the options are text. Um, and then there is also the number of questions again that increases uh, with a multiple choice longer script. Um, the number of questions is again different from six in preliminary to seven in first. Um, and in C1 advanced, there is a, a, another difference in the sense that there are six questions, uh, but there are not three options, there are four options. So this again increases the complexity of the task. Now, the matching task, um, the matching task in B2 first, the, 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 red, the red framed task uh, on my slide, um, expects or requires the candidates to match one list of speakers to one list of items. Whereas the multiple matching in C1 advanced uh, requires the candidates to match the list of speakers to two separate lists of items. So this shows very, very clearly the increase in, in difficulty. Oh, before that, though, um, I was going to say that, um, can I go back? Well, no, that there are other differences, of course, to do with the uh, speed of the speech um, that, that candidates uh, hear and, of course, the, the complexity of the language of the speak that the speakers use. But those were the, the, the differences that are easy to, to track even without listening. And now going on to, to, to speaking, um, the speaking tests are also quite standardized and consistent in their format across levels. Uh, they're all made up of the four stages, um, interview, uh, examiner candidate, um, long turn on a visual prompt, interaction, and a follow up to that interactive task. But a visible change, again, without going into much detail, um, a visible change is in the photo discussion task where you can see the progression. In B1 preliminary, there is one photo to be described. In B2 first, there are two photos and uh, candidates are supposed to compare and contrast. And in C1 advanced, the candidates are given three photos. They have to choose two, which then they have to compare, contrast and speculate. So the requirement, first of all, goes up from describing to comparing and contrasting and to comparing, contrasting and speculating. So here you have, again, some examples to, to make this even clearer. Um, the, um, the one family picture at the top uh, is a B1 picture to describe. In, in a red frame is a B2 task with the question printed on it. And the green task is in C1, obviously, with the three pictures. And you notice that there are two questions attached to, to the task. Now, apart from the instructions regarding the photos, um, again, an important underlying parameter is the complexity of the topics, which is reflected, uh, of course, not just in the picture, in the photo description or photo discussion task, but throughout the speaking task. So topics uh, evolve gradually from everyday to familiar to less familiar and even abstract as we go up the scale. So thinking of, um, of this pattern, of this feature of having consi consistent task formats, um, I'd like you to take a few moments to, to think, uh, we don't have time, I would have wanted to start a new poll, but we don't have time to switch windows. Um, do you think there are advantages for teaching? So having these consistent, similar task formats, they differ 
which differ only through certain parameters. Um, does that help us in any way in the classroom, in, in teaching, do you think? If you'd like to, to put something down in the chat, does that help you to know that one and the same task format, say a reading multiple choice, um, is present at several levels? So development through competences, we know how much to want from students to know, yes. Okay, familiarity, yes. Okay, so this this probably means that um, I guess the most important advantage that, that we can get is um, that we can identify more easily, we can pin it down what students can and what they cannot yet do. Um, just as we decomposed reading skills a few minutes ago, uh, we can in the same way observe the same differentiation by looking at the progression of task format. So we can see, for example, that a, um, a student can answer, um, can respond to a matching task in listening, but is not quite ready to match those speakers to two lists. They can only manage to, to match those speakers to one list. And that gives us an idea. It's, it's easier to, to identify exactly the segments and the sub skills that our students have or still need to develop. And this, of course, also means that this makes it easier for us to adapt the tasks we take to the classroom, uh, making them either more challenging in order to add motivation. For example, if we add an extra question or if we delete one of the questions um, or by making it easier, choosing a text on an easier topic um, or making the requirements a, a bit easier to provide scaffolding and support when students are not yet familiar or confident using the language to respond to that task. And finally, of course, all this, uh, it's, it's, it's so important to make the most of such task formats at different scale or at different levels of complexity on the scale uh, because students have different ability levels or may be better at one type of tasks than at others. And this, of course, within the same class you're teaching. OK, and, and this takes us uh, to the final point of how important um, the results, the way we communicate the results is to, to learning uh, and to providing feedback to helping learners for, to, do, to, to learn and improve even more. So um, results represent valuable feedback for learning, of course, if they are, first of all, clear, meaning here clear to a non-assessment specialist, of course, to the learner to their parents, to uh, you teachers, to the um, employers and university admission offices and so on. And then how specific are they? How detailed, what level of detail is useful to highlight areas of competence in a way that is meaningful for the candidate and all the other stakeholders that require the certificate? And clear results means not just an easy to understand representation, for example, through numbers on a scale from 1 to 10. Um, clarity also includes support for the users to interpret the results. Um, what does, for example, score 3 exactly mean? Um, and this, of course, is also related to how can scores be compared? So again, the candidates, teachers and other institutional stakeholders may understand what the candidate can do actually in the language. Um, that's why our certificates provide um, a numerical representation using a scale, the Cambridge English scale, leaning on the CFR with an overall score as well as detailed scores per skill. Um, and the statement of results includes clear guidance as to what type of exam the certificate relates to and what the scores 
reflect. And in this way, this summative assessment, the Cambridge English exam, um, can also be used in, in goal setting for further learning and for further improvement, because you can see um, it's very intuitive. Um, the visual representation is combined, is integrated with the numerical results linked all this to the CFR. And this makes the result clear, detailed and easy to compare. And again, um, looking at lower levels, uh, this is another example for young learners where results are also mapped against the CFR and the Cambridge English scale. Although we don't report results here in terms of scores, but in terms of numbers of shields, um, young learners tests have an even stronger formative component, focusing on achievement, on motivation, on feedback for further learning rather than providing a summative judgment. Um, and um, finally, these young learner certificates provide explicit descriptors at each level based on the CFR descriptor so that anyone looking at that certificate can imagine what the child can do um, at the current level of their uh, language development. So to wrap up, um, Cambridge English qualifications are indeed summative assessments, but they support step-by-step -step learning of, um, of English and learning for life. Um, how do they do that? Um, they do that by um, having a learning-oriented design through a can-do design philosophy and the step-by-step -step approach. Uh, where feedback and progress are embedded through consistent formats, through differentiation at each level, and meaningful and learning-oriented results. Okay, um, time for questions. Um, I'm quite eager to to see if you or to to read your questions and um, see if. Uh, if there are any um, any things that were left, unclear. Uh, Tadorka has written. What is expected students to know? Sorry, uh, Tadorka has written. What is expected students to know? But I'm not sure exactly what that refers to. Tadorka, would you like to write um, a bit more fully on on what you mean? I will move the camera. Because I've been talking so much, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, which is exactly what we don't want to do in our lessons. <laughs> but how do you incorporate critical thing? Okay, <laughs> wow. Um, okay, so the first, I meant that the test sh show or help what students are expected to know. That's right. Um, so by looking at the tests and and certificates and results. Uh, it, it becomes easy to, to track what was learned, what has been mastered, and what uh, would be the next goals, comparing uh, the descriptors to the next level, comparing the tasks to the tasks at the next level, um, the next learning goals become very, very palpable, very easy to, to engage with. And the question coming from Nina, how do you incorporate critical thinking in the exams? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, actually, I presented on this topic for an hour, uh, which I don't have right now. Um, critical thinking is, is embedded in, um, in reading and listening comprehension, for example, where uh, extracting the main point and distinguishing it from detail is one important aspect in critical thinking, especially for um, school and academic purposes. Um, um, but we have to be careful here because critical thinking might be an area in itself, which might mean that we might be tempted to start testing 
candidates on their thinking abilities. Um, so this year is a very thin line to draw. So um, embedding what is critical thinking from the communication perspective. So identifying main point, what the speaker is actually actually saying uh, implicitly, so implied meaning without mingling or, or blending your own interpretation, subjective interpretation. Um, this is very good and it belongs in a language um, competence exam, uh, but it shouldn't turn into, into an exam testing, as I said, logic, for example, or other thinking skills. So, um, yes, that might be the topic for next year's Cambridge, Cambridge Day or Cambridge uh, experience. Um, does the exam have a focus on accuracy or on fluency and how is assessment for both provided for? Yes, so in both speaking and writing, um, as I uh, suggested in there, when I gave the example for speaking, uh, the marking criteria include both grammar and vocabulary and other parameters, other, other criteria, other aspects. Now, grammar and vocabulary can be regarded as uh, being accurate, but accuracy is not enough. It may be enough at levels A2 and B1, but from at least level B1 upwards, B2 at least, um, range becomes very important. Just being accurate is no longer enough because if a candidate only uses a simple present tense, uh, that doesn't have to be level B2 or level C1. So even with grammar and vocabulary, it's not just ac accuracy is there, of course, without accuracy, we cannot make ourselves understood. Uh, but then there is a distinction being made between errors that are just slips or errors that do not impede uh, the communication, the, the communication of the message uh, and the other errors that make communication difficult. Uh, but even apart from grammar and vocabulary and apart from accuracy, there are many other aspects which have to do with appropriateness, which have to do with fluency, with uh, cohesion and coherence and with interactive abilities. So that is why to answer your question very, very briefly, accuracy is there, but there's much more to language than that. And that is captured by the other uh, marking criteria. Hope I answered your question in a in an uh, in a way that that is easy to understand okay are there any other questions people thanking i'm i thank you so much for for being here and uh participating <laughs> you'd love to attend uh, yeah of course um give feedback to <laughs> the organizers and let's have next year uh a talk on critical thinking in cambridge english exams <laughs> That will be great. Okay. Well, um, if there are no other questions, then uh, please don't forget uh, to, as Katie said, um, to fill out that, that survey to get your certificate. I wish you good health, first of all, success in uh, whatever you undertake, whether it's teaching, so professionally or in your personal life. And looking forward to meeting you in Sofia sometime in the near future. <laughs>